what I am is the um, founder and principal economist at First Grain, which is a rice advisory service. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm going to talk about the U.S. and the world. And you can leave at any point if you have to go do something else. Hi. So what, what I'd like to do is to get started and make sure that um, it's all working correctly. Uh, this is... Um, Hold on, just one second. Okay, so what we have here is a slide that is what I'm talking about, and that is buyers. I was a rice buyer for 18 years, and I bought rice globally, and in that capacity, I always tried to buy just enough to satisfy the accountants is the accountants are, don't want to put out any money for anything until I discovered that the rice price goes up and down. It doesn't just go sideways for a buyer or a seller. For several years, the world market has been just in time. Okay, So then you don't own anything more than what you need immediately. But what's happened is that we have gone from a just-in-time mentality to I don't know what's going on mentality to a just-in-case mentality. And there are two countries that have been just-in-case for years. One of them is India and the other is China. So I break the market down into two parts. You'll get it into all of this. And then at the end, I'll give a forecast for what's going to happen over the next 60 to 90 days, which is one of the things I do for my customers, Okay, the rice market. If you're here for cotton, yes, rice is white, but it's not fuzzy, OK? So. The world has been turned upside down. And there was a dictator in Russia, and his name was Vladimir Lenin. I happen to speak Russian. And he said, there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks where decades happen. What we just had in the last two weeks is decades, and we're going to spend a long period of time trying to sort all this stuff out. Russia has torn up the strategic arms agreement, and China has come out saying, I want to do what I can to help out Russia militarily. And that means that we have, and we have our vice president saying that, uh, that Russia's done crimes against humanity. If I said to one of you, you're doing crimes against humanity, that would be fighting words, wouldn't it? So, as, Mitch McConnell said, anybody that wants to side with Russia is dumber than dirt. <laughs> I think that's what's happening now is that people are trying to take sides. You've got basically several superpowers. One is the U.S., one is Russia, one is China, and the other is India. And they don't always agree on everything. But what you have to do is to be able to um, be able to buy groceries and rice groceries are cheaper than other groceries and plane tickets. And as a consequence, our domestic demand has been stronger than is being reported by the USDA. And as a result, we have something to replace the pandemic to worry about. I quote from a, a religious writer named Corey Ten Boom, it says, you worry about tomorrow. That's not empty tomorrow of sorrow, but it empties today of strength. So we don't know exactly where anything's going to go. We don't know what's going to happen to our farm or to our family or our dog. We just lost a dog this morning. My son's dog died. But we do have someone that we can go to, and that is, in fact, Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. And that's how I live my life, is trusting the future eventually to a, a God. So the, uh, the situation is the leading indicators are telling us 100% likelihood we'll have a recession this year. We don't know how bad it's going to get or what factors have to be there, what unemployment rate, 
or interest rate or interest pivots. But in the U.S., we're going to get some kind of recession. What, what it does to food demand, we're not sure. But we're going to have a wild year, which is just getting started up higher. Uh, it's probably because the thing's not close enough to my mouth. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. So as a result, we're going to have a recession. We don't know how it's going to happen. And we'll hopefully get a recovery in China so that there'll be more demand out there for ag products. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the price in the market. In the last week, we've had a lot of specs that have gone into the market. And when they go in the market and they sell it short, guess what happens to the price? It goes down. And this is a chart of the market for rice. And in that, it, I've been telling my people it's 18 is the high and there's support way down below the market, about 16, somewhere in there. That's a 38%, let me see here. Yeah, it's a 38% correct, whatever. Anyway, it's a correction, it's a red line. That's where the market's headed. And once the market gets there, here's what it's gonna do. Well, it's not going to do what Brazil does because Brazil's into harvest. So these two markets don't sink together. Between the U.S. and Brazil is where most of the supply in the Western Hemisphere comes from for rice. And the prices meander between these two, these two very big suppliers of rice to the Western Hemisphere. What I've discovered about the market is, and these are... These are long term charts, is that since 2004, every bull market where the price goes up, it doesn't top out until April or later. So this market has not made its final move. And when it makes its move, it could be violent because the specs are super short right now. Probably April, maybe May, maybe as far as August, depending how it sorts itself out. U.S. domestic stocks are really very tight. Oh, and they weren't going to sell any rice out of the U.S. to Mexico. They just sold 75,000 tons. And the report from Mexico from USDA said, we won't sell any rice to Mexico this year. I don't know what trader they were talking to, but it's not in the cards. Argentina's got a trout. We don't know how bad it is yet. Brazil is going to produce less rice. They're going to carry over nothing this year. And so we've got tight stocks in South America, a tight situation down there. And every indication is that we have not finished this bull market. Okay. Now you can leave. You know what I was going to do over the next 90 days. <laughs> and you don't leave, please. I need everybody I can for my ego. Um, this is India. India is about 20 times bigger than the whole. Western Hemisphere is about 5% of world supplies and, 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 and of demand. And India is a heavy mover along with China. There's actually two countries, China and India, that are half of the world rice market. What's done there provides the floor underneath the market. But the rest of the world matters because China and India consume 51% of the world's rice and the rest of the world, yes. Yes. Oh, that's spot. Spot market. Yeah, that's a good question. But it's a spot market, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I was wondering about the new crop. Well, the new crop's going to trade a discount. That new crop trade discount has come in from $2 to 95 cents this week. And, and yet what happens in old crop will affect new crop. So it'll be a discount to old crop. So if you get the spot there, the, the new crop should be lower, mostly. Yeah, yeah, well, September, really. Because the September has the liquidity of new crop, okay? So what we've got is a market that is coiling up. It is not done, in my humble opinion. I could be wrong. Does that answer your question? Good, very good. Oh, my God, this is a really good group. Um, this is the uh, prices in the Western Hemisphere. On the left, I'm sorry. The Western Hemisphere on the right, it's the Americas, and on the left is Asia. Asia sets the floor in the market, and then we trade in our own way in the Western Hemisphere. The Indian price has gone up. I don't think it's over with. They're not going to remove the export tax on ordinary rice. 
And the reason is their wheat crop was less than perfect. There was not much wrong with the rice crop. The wheat market was less than perfect. Okay, so I'm going to get into that. There's two players that really matter in the world market besides the rest of the world, and that's India and China. You can call, the, call it the word Chindia. Has anyone ever heard the word Chindia? That's when, uh, okay. Anyway, that's, uh, that's those two countries. And they're not exactly buddies. They have their own situation. They have a long border with one another, and they sort of shoot each other's soldiers on those borders. So here's a quote. The rest of my talk is going to be about the losses of capacity, and that's going to have a lot to do with what price you're going to get in the next 10 months. Um, this is a, uh, this is a uh, CEO of Bungie. Has anyone ever heard of Bungie? Yeah, I love what he said. I said, I think globalization is done for a period. Can you hear me? Welcome. And we have a supply problem or demand problem. Get solved. Every origin, every destination is available to solve the problem in the past. That's no longer the case. So what's happened is we've gone from a world order where everything is interconnected to a group of trading partners, and you can be part of that group if you have export of food to certain people and maybe to others you don't allow them to export. There's three fertilizers that are important at different places in the world for rice. One is potash, phosphates, and urea. I'm going to talk about each one of them because the price this year will be related to any problems in any one of those supplies. It's not a demand problem, it's a supply problem. And the potash fertilizer business, the blue lines are exports, the blue areas and the red areas are imports. And the potash is needed in the US and Brazil and China. And the suppliers are Russia, Ukraine, and Canada. We have a need for potash, but we have Canada near, nearby. So if, um, if you look at the U.S., it's really U.S., Canada, and Mexico. And we're all integrated together into one trading group, okay? Phosphates. Phosphates are very important in certain countries where the soil, soil is very low quality, like in China, um, in northern um, Brazil, the Cerrados, and in Western Australia, the soils are really poor, much worse than in the Delta or definitely in the Midwest. Can you hear me okay in the back? Um, so what's happened is that we think that there is this swine flu fever that is spreading over China, and they're going to have to decimate their hog herds again. And that means they have one less thing to feed their people with if, if the hog, the pork meat goes down. Around China, if you look at maps of where the swine flu vi fever is happening, is like a ring of fire. And then you get into China and they're not reporting anything. So we assume it's very bad. So when they get into a problem, they don't report it. Same thing with Russia. So what they're going to do is they're going to be very, very much interested in keeping as much phosphate as they can in their country. Because without phosphate, they don't get the yields for the fertilizer from the soils there. So they, right now, they're going about 40% of what they did last year. That means pe some people are not going to get phosphates. So phosphate's not totally critical everywhere, but it's critical on soils that don't have any fertility. In China, it takes four to five times as much fertilizer to get the job done as it does in the central U.S., in the, in the grain belt. Now my question is, is China really totally food secure? If, if I'm correct that the reports that they have another round of uh, swine flu, swine virus, then they're going to be very conscious of how much fertilizers they let out of the country, because fertilizers are food, basically, for them. China is still the biggest food importer in the world, despite reporting all these stocks. 
China this year was the driest since records began being kept back in 1961. Down in the south where a lot of the long grains produced, along in the Yangtze Valley, they have had to go back over to coal because the hydroelectric facilities aren't working. If that doesn't tell you they've got a water problem, nothing will tell you that. And that's the African swine flu virus. China holds most of the world's stocks of rice, wheat, and soybeans, and corn. So if their stocks are not correct, and they were, they're higher than they should be. Um, you okay in the back, Joey? Okay, he's got a thumb up, that means something. Then the world has got a problem. China's reserves and grain every year are at historic highs. Here's the one that really puzzles me about China. It claims to have had bumper harvest for 19 years in a row. Do you know any agricultural area that has bumper harvest for 19 years in a row? I know of none. You can lie for 19 years in a row, but you don't necessarily have what you say you have. Increasing grain imports suggest demand is exceeding supply, whatever it is. I'm gonna talk about the rice stocks in a little more detail. Could actual grain production in China be a lot lower than they're reporting? They overreported their population by at least 100 million people recently. So that means that they have less Chinese than they'd been saying before. And that's about the third of the population of the US, which is the fourth largest, third largest population in the world. There's China, India and then the US. The US is the third most populous country in the world. We don't think of that when we, we look at the world, but it's really a pretty big place. Uh, could actual production be lower? I think so, and I'm gonna give some slides that effect. The good news for the farm buyers in the US is that the urea and fertilizer costs are, are dropping a lot, but that doesn't mean the market's gonna keep going down. As the demand comes back in, this thing can reverse itself. We are suggesting that you get covered on your inputs in here as we move into the spring. And here's the problem. The problem is that Henry Hub gas is at a very low level, but the price of Asian and European gas is still very high because they know that you can only store so much gas and that this fall, it could get very short again. Distil, distil, distillate prices are already starting to go up a little bit. This is an opportunity to get covered on your inputs, not necessarily your rice, but on your inputs. Okay, this is a friend of mine up in Colorado that is a geopolitical scientist. And he knows about demography and a lot of these kind of things. He used to live up in Austin. We used to meet every month. His name's Peter Zion. If you go on the internet, you might want to try and read some of his stuff, it's really fascinating. It'll make you think outside your little local box, whatever it is. The black, the black thing is the flow of black crude around the world, and it's mostly going through India, Indian Ocean, to Southeast Asia and the countries of Asia. And in that process, there are pirates and there are state-sponsored piracy that can happen two shipments. So you've got everything worked out, you got it all set up, and then suddenly, goodbye, Sheridan. Um, and as a result, um, at any point, you can be disrupted. Not saying it's going to happen right now. But we live in a very scary world right now in terms of availability of supplies. Okay. This is good news for us, not such good news for Brazil necessarily or Australia. The US has one, one thing it's very short on, and that is uh, potash. So 93% of our potash is imported, but it comes from guess where, Canada. So that's not very far away. It's just a little auto trip over there. Everything else we're more or less self-sufficient in. We can get it very easily, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. So you got a big exporter, big big grower of grain, and it's 
right within their capability to get what they need when they need it. You take Brazil, 95% of the nitrogen comes from, from uh, Russia. And then the guy was saying, of course, you'll get it because that's important for China to have the urea in Brazil so that they can buy their, their supplies. And that's, of course, if it happens. But if there's a problem with Russia, right now they're out blowing up utilities and uh, killing civilians and putting in uh, uh, torture camps. I've been told as many as 70 torture camps in the Russian-controlled part of Ukraine. I don't know what they're trying to get out of them. And uh, so right now, everything is sort of okay. But if anything happens, Brazil could be in difficulty because it imports almost all of its fertilizer requirements. The same is true of Australia. Western Australia and, and the Cerrados have very poor, poor soils. So they're getting their carbohydrates grown through hydrocarbons. This is a thing put together by my friend Peter, and what it's basically saying is that the th three pre-war, the three war economies, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, are providing up to 40% of corn, 14% of wheat, 21%, potash, 47%, and ammonia, 16%. Okay. Okay, so now we're shifting gears. Why is everybody so bearish on the rice price? The reason they're bearish on the rice price is because the stocks have gone down into the beginning of the last two decades and then have started moving up since then. And in that capacity, most of it is coming out of India and China, not anywhere else. They're the two big. So China has all the rice that he, they could need, and yet they are the second largest importers of rice. I ask the question, what's wrong with this picture? Something's wrong with this picture, because if they were as heavy in stocks as they are, they would not be importing. Don't know the answer. Winston Churchill said China is an enigma wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in a conundrum. So the world of my rice is into two parts. One part is Chindia, or India and China, and the other part is the rest of the world. That's where we live in the rest of the rice world. 49% 40, of the world's consumption of rice comes from these countries on the left, and on the right, 51%, China and India, okay? The two lines are the blue line, which represents stocks, and the other, good morning. The other one is, um, is trade, imports. In the last 20 years, 20 million metric ton increase in imports of rice into the non-China, non-Indian countries. What's happened is that this bearish notion in Asia has crept up on them, so now they've got down to the tightest stocks in many, many years, and they're not buying rice. Well, they're doing it now because they realized that everybody was not was going hand to mouth. Now they're going to be buying just in case. And as this be panic begins to settle in over the next five months, you'll see the rice price not go down. It may not go up, but it's not going to, going to go down. You've got Bangladesh, the Philippines, and, and Indonesia stockpiling. Stockpiling rice because they can't afford not to have the rice. Now I'm going to sidetrack for a minute on water, which is not a problem yet, but it will become a problem as you move down the line. If Brazil is the ideal country for water per capita, India is the ideal country for growing things because half of their country is arable. The problem with India, the problem with Brazil is that only about 8 to 16% of their country, depending on what you think is going on in the Amazon, uh, is tillable. One of the largest exporters in the world. India, 52% is tillable, but if you look at their percent per capita 
relative to Brazil, China, India, and Pakistan should never be exporting rice. They're exporting rice, but they shouldn't be exporting rice. So they ain't got no water. Within the next 25 years, it's going to become apparent to politicians, we can't export water. And that's what grains are. They're virtual, virtually water is what they are. We're in a middle category of exporting countries, along with Vietnam and Thailand. And we have about five times as much water as these countries on the bottom. And over the last 25 years, the re renewable supplies of water in all of these countries gone down by anywhere from 14 to 25 percent. Assuming that that happens over the next 25 years, by 2050, our water in the world will be down by 50 percent. Sometime between now and 2050, we're going to have water problems everywhere. And they've and the politicians can't really deal with it very well because if you take a position in, in water, you're going to lose half the vote. That's not the good way to operate. Okay, so the disruptions this year could come from anywhere. The most likely places is food insecurity in the U.S., 34 million persons in the U.S. alone, the wealthiest country in the world, and we're taking away the, the lunch program from the children in March. I don't know what's going to happen. Global buying priority is shifting from cost and price to secure and available supplies. It's going to become locational, not, not, not um, price. War and pandemics have made buyers very nervous. The pandemic created unreliable supplies, and now we've got war in the Ukraine. Russia, as I said, will probably go after Ukrainian ag production as soon as they can get their tanks rolling over the soil, which they can't do right now. Next summer, replacing utilities and killing civilians is a hobby. And they will go after farmers, they will go after infrastructure, and I'm sorry, but I think they'll go after ports too, like Odessa, except that maybe China will object to that. So it's, it's a game of getting the wheat price short and getting the wheat price up so they can buy more soldiers, get more war going. China and Taiwan are, are watching closely what's happening in the Ukraine. The Ukraine war, in my opinion, I'm fluent in Russian in case you wanted to know. And uh, I was in the, I was like a spy in the military, in, in the army. I know a little bit about what's going on. And, uh, As it gets into killing farmers and civilians, then it's unbelievable. They're burning up fields now. If, they, if it works out for them, they will short the wheat market to where the price goes up. They want it higher. That's really what they want. Um, I already told you that the China's statistics are dubious, particularly population. Also grain stocks, 19 years up. And Russia has no good data at all. They don't release anything. So they're kind of like a black hole. I think yields are going to be more costly of ag inputs. But in this country, you're blessed with extremely low natural gas prices, which are going to be helpful to you as you get into the spring and you start to take your short position and lengthen it out to buy what you need to grow what you need to grow. So potash, urea, and phosphates, to me, are up in the air. I'm not saying that any of them are not going to work out. But I can tell you, phosphate exports from China are down 50% this year versus last year. So if you're getting your phosphates for your garden from China, you're going to have to go elsewhere. China, Russia, and Brazil have poor soils, just incredibly poor soils, where it all comes from hydrocarbons to produce hyd hyd hydro carbohydrates. And Brazil, I was t talking to a trader this morning on the floor. I was presenting this to him. And I said, Brazil gets 80% of its, its urea from Russia. And he said, yeah, and China is going to make sure that that urea gets to Brazil so that they don't short the grain markets because they're net food importers. So, and that's why China sa said, I'll do what we can to help try and solve this problem in the Ukraine, which means basically that Brazil, that uh, Russia takes over. But if anything happens contrary to popular opinion, this whole market could just blow up in our faces. And natural gas and urea are very volatile, and we are certainly cheaper 
than Europe or the Far East. So American farmers are in a very good position, even though this is a very dark forecast for the world because of what's going on in this country. Africa's importing fertilizer, India, Russia, and China will work together for their own self-interest, but they're not all friends, okay? Okay, very quickly, we've got a balance sheet in this country. And what we've got is we've got imports that are up 50% since 2017. And that's aromatics from Thailand. Our domestic usage is up, rah, rah, 20%, but it's all coming from the Far East. Our acreage is not changing. So we've got demand in the U.S. going up, and it's for imported rice like, like Thai jasmine. And it's not that we're planting more acres right now. As far as the stocks go and the acreage, what's going to happen, it's up in the air. The reason is that this little slide in the rice price is telling people don't plant rice. And when the, when the ratio is below 54, there's a tendency to plant less rice, as has occurred in the last two years, two to three years. And we don't know what that effect it's going to have. Nobody can tell me what the acreage is going to be total for long grain in the South. And I've asked a lot of people. I don't really know. The river went dry, and then the barge rate went up. And the basis that we get for rice versus the futures market in Chicago has been a spastic mess, basically. So the gist of the talk that we've given today is that it's all about managing rice inventories. And in the big world, which is Asia, people are waking up and discovering that just because India reports they've got the rice and China reports that they've got the rice, the rice may not be available. And as a result, buyers are now going out and starting to acquire rice. And the, the Indian price is going up. Number one is world is splitting, splitting into um, trade polarities. The US and the Western Hemisphere, you've got China and Brazil needing the product from there. And then you've got Russia trying to reduce the amount of wheat in the world by killing people. You've got to have a friend that can export food to you and, and you can guarantee that you can get it from them. Otherwise, you'll be left out in the cold as a, as a, as a, as a nation. No trade routes are, are secure anymore. That's what the, the guy at Bungie is saying, why it's all split up. You've got an empire that has 10 times the power in its navy of anywhere else in the world, and, but they're not, we're not defending the world like we used to. No, no trade routes are secure anymore. So the world price negative narrative has turned from bearish to stocks and bearish to can I get those stocks? Do they exist? Are they lying? We don't know. And then you take a country like India, and I have a friend that trades rice out of Mumbai, and he's saying, we've gone from being trying to be the world supplier of wheat and rice to turning inward. When they turn inward, the politicians become worried about supplies of food. And that's where we're at right now. Politicians all over the world are worried if they're going to have enough for their people as you move into the summer. Probably this year will be a mixed bag. But in 2014, 2024, anything can happen as stocks get depleted and we have to deal with the situation. That's why I'm kind of bullish longer term all the way into 2024. Your grain could get more expensive, Mr. Buyer. Fertilizer, shipping costs. What's basically happening is that other countries are going to have to start defending their own borders and their own food supplies. And as they do it, their budget's going to shrink. And the financing of farmers and giving it away for votes, like in India, is going to become more difficult. They just ain't going to have the money to do everything. The U.S. will win big, so it's a dark forecast that I'm giving you, but it's a very bright forecast for U.S. farmers. And, and you should be grateful that you live in the U.S. Because what's going to happen is the U.S. has the currency reserve of the world, so we can put the currency where we want to. 60% of all the navigable rivers in the world are located in the U.S. And... River navigability is one-fifth to one-tenth of what it is for trucks or rail. 
It's just a much cheaper way to go about shipping things. This river right next door is one of the major benefactors for the US. And we have a democracy. We have a castle. And that's the, 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 the Western Hemisphere. And it's surrounded by a moat, Atlantic and Pacific. And the only way you can invade the US is to fling a missile over. I'm telling you, I worked in the military. And back in the 70s, we had most of the stuff we have now and more. And if someone flips a missile at us, they'll know exactly where it came from. And the next thing that happens is you're dust. You're just going to be blown up immediately. And people know that. That's why they're, it's not because they, they want to like people, but it's because if they want to really get Mr. Big, they can become Mr. Small very quickly. So the U.S. is, other than the politics, which have always been kind of hard to figure out, we have everything. The good Lord has given us everything. I'm telling you, we've got everything. We shouldn't be afraid to trust an unknown future for the world to a known God. Because he's in charge. We're not in charge. That's the thing. It's not about our worries. And worries will not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it will empty today of its strength. So that's pretty much it. If you have a phone and you want to take a photograph or of the QR code, you will get a free winter update. This one is more a spring update. But the other one is a winter update and is built off of that thing this winter. And I would really love to follow up with any of you that had questions from what I've said. But otherwise, that's about all I have. I love that question that this guy had here. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I think that the market's a lot tighter than people report. And I think a lot more rice has been sold. I think demand in the U.S. is much higher than they are saying it is. They're trying to come up to it. This could be a record year for domestic demand. That being said, of course, Asian rice continues to pour into this market. But um, you don't build a rice price when it's cheap beans. And remember, when in the old days, when the rice price went high, the bean price was at eight, nine dollars. Now it's at fifteen dollars, and it's part of a larger question about biodiesel. I think uh, biodiesel is going to start chewing up acreage as we move down the line. And if the wheat market goes, wheat is a weed. It is grown on the perimeter of society, not in the center of it, but it could take over and become a price item for the cornfields of Illinois and uh, uh, and push out cotton, push out rice. Then it becomes an acreage battle for who gets what as you move down the line into the, what I think are going to be shortages based on human nature and war, not just what's happening today or tomorrow. Did that help at all? Could have a better rice price next year. Could very well have a better rice price next year out of the fall low, which is now at $16. Could maybe go down to $15, something like that. But there's no reason for it to stay down unless, unless you know something I don't about world stocks of rice. We're into something really unusual, and it's very sad that the richest country in the world is cutting back on food stamp programs for, for children. I, my company is named First Grain. That comes from a Chinese aphorism. I love Chinese aphorisms. It says, more precious than pearls and jade are the five grains of which rice is first. So if you have a child and he's starving and, and you need to buy rice, you'll go into your jewelry box and take out your pearls and jade and sell them to buy rice. We don't know what hunger is all about in the United States. Thanks to all of you men and women. We don't know what it's all about. But we got a gentleman back there that loves to give rice away so that people can 
can have enough rice to eat. Your, your job is going to go from a minor job to a major center of focus in policy and everything else. And how much money do you want is what they're going to ask as we move down the line to the new farm bill. I personally think that's the case. And we're discovering that needs are very basic. They're not just about GMO and carbon and that kind of thing. It's about getting a full belly. Yes, sir. The costs of growing the stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mike, do you have any idea why our yields aren't going up for Jasmine? Pardon? Varietal development. We should be pouring lots of money into aromatics, in my humble opinion. 20 years ago, I went over to Thailand thinking about shutting our mills down and buying everything from Thailand and buying aromatics from Thailand. But that never went anywhere for us because Uncle Ben's does not grow aromatic rices, doesn't sell aromatic rices. It's not part of their brand recognition. But yeah, I, I, I am surprised that so little work has been done. And I'm not blaming the breeders. I'm not sure it's an easy solution. But it needs, needs to be done because what we've had is we've had since 2017 or earlier, we've had a dramatic increase in domestic consumption. We've had no change in acreage or it's gone down. That's telling you that it's being filled by the aromatics, both in this country. There are farmers that grow aromatics in this country and then also the imports. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Sorry. There's a lot of nasty things out there. Yeah. What will the price of rice be if we have or we don't have it? Floor? Yeah, how long the price is? Oh, I, I don't really think that rice is in the general mix of components that are going to drag the rice price down. Demand is going to be there because it is the cheapest grocery still, as I said in my thing earlier. I think that uh, the kind of things that will suffer will be technology, Will be um, will be mattresses, things that you can put off for a period of time, but not rice. So I don't think that the recession, unless it's really severe, is going. And then, of course, then the government will step in and start feeding people. So I, I can't see the price of rice going down. It's the cost of doing it, what he said, the input costs, the interest rates, all of that, that's going to determine how much rice is grown. And again, I think we're getting into a guns and butter battle out in the Far East where they've been just lavishing farmers with subsidies, but they can't continue it. They're already finding problems making the budget balance. Their currency is falling apart. Did I answer your question? I don't know. Sometimes I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> Any other questions? You guys have been so cooperative. And uh, yes. It's going to come back sooner than May. What I'm saying is that we're right on the edge of the last leg up, and that will happen probably by April or May or June, and it will probably be well above anything people were thinking about. And it could be caused by rice or demand, or it could be caused by all this other freaky stuff out there that could at any point start inflation starting up again. And But by that time, of course, the acreage will be pretty well cast in stone. Hold it, yes. At this point in time, you're already down into the 16, almost in the 16 area. And my work indicates that we have one leg up. And when that leg comes, it'll go too high and then it'll go too low, which is what always happens. That hasn't happened yet. What we've had is a stuck market for months and months as the stuff gets consumed. And we've got problems in the rice growing area of South America. If South America has rice growing problems, the rest is history. Huh? 
I hate to tell you this. It's something I don't really advocate with my customers. Do you know what the market eats for breakfast? Hope Toasties. <laughs> the market doesn't care about hope. It just lives and breathes. Right now, the specs are super short. Never go with the specs, generally speaking. Go against them. When they're long, it's going to go down. When it's short, it's going to go up. And I've been trading these markets for 40 years. I've been half the rice on the exchange for 20 years. And my customers are much bigger than I was. And the long and short of it is that the worst time to bet on the market is when it's in the direction of the specs, unless they have special insight. Does that answer it? I would say if you can get it down to 16, that'd be nice. But you can't call Chicago and say, I need a $16 price. I do what they're going to do. Any other, my gosh, this is the smartest group of people I've had the opportunity to speak to. And I'm grateful. Yes. If wheat goes up and stops being in the cellar, which I think it's close to not being in the cellar, wheat is a weed. So it's pushed, it's been pushed out. If you look at the acreage, it's all been pushed out to the edge. If they come in and start taking away tomatoes and everything else, because wheat is the most consumed product in the world, much more than rice. Two things can move this market up in this country. One is biodiesel with soybeans, and the other is wheat going bananas. And that's what Russia wants to do. They want to cut out the exports of wheat from Ukraine. They're doing it by killing people and blowing up ports like Odessa and that kind of thing. And I, every, what I'm seeing is the wheat exports for years now are going to be curtailed because of what's happened in Ukraine. Well, people should be preparing. I don't know exactly where the rice is going to be because they're doing The reason why rice hasn't responded is because rice has nothing to do with Russia or Ukraine. But if China decides to, to get into Taiwan, then suddenly rice comes to the top. And if they find out that they were lying about their grain stocks like they've been lying about their population, one thing that I've noticed is that if you look at the pro pro profile of populations, China has two to three times as many people over 65 like myself as India. And rice is backbreaking work. I was talking to someone who actually went out and tried rice like they grew in India. And it's not for the young of heart or the young of body. It's for the young of heart and young of body, not for old folks. So we have a labor problem. And Chinese rice labor costs are going way up on them. And I don't know how we're going to survive what's going to happen without major structural changes. But what will happen is all these clusters like Russia, China, the Western Hemisphere, and India. Nobody's heard from India, but India has one of the longest borders with China among the major players. And they're going to take care of their needs. But it's not that I can't think these things through. It just gives me nightmares thinking about them, to be honest. I don't think we're at the end of the end of time, but it sure is looking that way. But as, as my Lord and Savior said, you'll never know the day or hour. If you think you know the day or hour, you're probably screwed up in your head somewhere. And I think we'll get through this one. I think the U.S. is going to do really well versus anywhere else. That's why everybody's trying to get in here. Hello? Is anybody home? We live in an amazing place. What is it? Something you said in your book that I read twice. <laughs> yes! Yeah. I can't say I remember everything. The few things you said about China and rice. One was the loss, you can't quantitate it, but the loss of experience when a Chinese farmer retires and goes to town. Yeah. That's one. And number two, there's a translocation of assets. There's a 
farmer living in Arkansas owns a farm and he retires. He sells the farm and goes to town with a huge bundle of money and assets. Yes. There's no ownership of property, unless my understanding is wrong, in China with the rice farm. No. So he, the, the farmer who's over 65 can't bend over anymore to the farm rice. He leaves, he takes this rice growing experience with that. And he goes to town without any assets. Yes. So that's a huge effect that I don't know if there's any way to index it. But it's crept up on us in the last 20 years. The demography in China is imploding, basically. They say they'll have half the population they have now by 2050 and half the water they have now as well. Did you know that in the case of rice in China, 70% of all the irrigated water goes to growing rice. Did you know that? That's why they want Tibet. That's why they what? That's why they won't leave Tibet. That's where their water is. Oh, of course, it's the glaciers up there. They've got a stake on the rivers of India from the north side. Another thing is the river. And, well, thank you very much, Neil. The, uh, the, um, I'm, I have another book inside me. If my wife would let me write it, I'm nasty when I write books. I just go into a state of just grumpiness. If I can write it with a smile, remember, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. I try and do that. Sometimes they're words they're not really in my heart, but I should have them in my heart. But it's a book on war. I don't know if I'll write it or not. I was in the army for two and a half, for two and a half years. Um, do you know only 1% of the U.S. has military experience? Did you know that? 1% and everybody's got a view on guns and all the rest of this stuff. Man. I wouldn't want to meet Milo at age 28, having been trained in sniper and quick kill. That's all I know. Okay, no, no political things. I once gave a talk in southern Missouri. That's the only time I've done it. And I said, I'm genetically related to two people. One is an American here on the other is a outlaw. And the guy said, oh, who are they? And this is true. It's in my genetic makeup. One is Jesse James and the other is Daniel Boone. But what I didn't understand was the audience thought Jesse James was the hero and Daniel Boone was, I don't know what. So don't ever say political statements with Republicans and Democrats. Thank you so much. And if anybody wants a copy of my book, Audible or otherwise, just email me or contact me. I've got it in Audible. I've got it in paperback and I've got it in Kindle. And they now have Kindle, which can also speak as well. We are into the most fascinating thing, and that is rice in the Western Hemisphere, where only 5% of the world's rice is grown. I think that will double or triple in the next 10 years. That's a forecast of mine. That would be in the next book I write, perhaps, is that, um, that the rest will go from being battered against the wall by rice to being the center of attention. Because what we have is not many people and lots of water and where there's not many people and lots of water, that's gonna to shift to places where they got huge numbers of people and no water. It just has to happen. Anyway, that's the way I see it. Any other questions? Yeah. I think you're going to see collapses in production long before you see collapses in demand. This is the only way demand collapses is with famine. And in the intermediate, it's going to be collapses of production, particularly in certain areas of Asia. So I would say if you look at the three giants or four giants, you got Russia, China, India and the US. The one that's most secure is the US by far because we've got the corner on food and energy and that just ain't going away. 
if you look at the others, then these strange made Fed fellows like Russia and China will get together because China wants to make sure that Russia is this. This was I'm learning this today from a guy who's in a position to know that China is going to make sure that Russia gets the urea to Brazil so they can eat. So they have a common interest in doing that. But um, India has remained fairly quiet through this whole process. And the problem with China for India is they're right next to one another. I would be a lot more jumpy if we had a thousand miles of border with China. We got a thousand, we got, we've got lots of countries in Latin America that border us, but none of them are going to contend with us in our nuclear arsenal or our Navy or any of the rest of the things. We have the whole Western world wrapped up except for a nuclear strike. And we're surrounded by a large moat. Warren Buffett was a very, is a very great investor and he said, what's the key to success in investing? Find a business that works and has a big moat around it. So if you were investing all your money, I would invest it all in the United States and Arkansas and places like that. Because you, we have an ongoing business called feeding people, and it has a huge moat. There's no way anybody's going to. The last time there was a challenge was the British Empire, which had a navy like we have today. And that was in the War of 1812. And it fritzed out on them. We got lots of problems, but one of them is not food or energy. And it's not U.S. dollars. I, it just amazes me that each of our aircraft carriers has more firepower than any Navy in the world. We can go over and play, 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 play Clint Eastwood with North Korea, put two aircraft carriers in nearby and say, go ahead, make my day. <laughs> okay, anything else? These questions are amazing. I'm going to go back over them. And if you want a copy of my book, I would love to have everybody say I've read it twice. My wife is ready to have me say goodbye. Okay, so you, 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 I've taken too much of your time, and I appreciate all of you because you feed the world, and you feed children. And of all the things out there, I look at that little girl with her little Snoopy ears, and you don't want that person to go hungry ever. Okay? I thank you all. Remember, worry will not empty tomorrow of his sorrow and heartbreak, but it will certainly empty today of any strength. So when we get these weird thoughts about what's going to happen, who's going to do what, go back and put them against that quote. Okay? Thank you all.